Um, Okay, hello, my name is Jamila Raymond. I'm from Transparency International UK, um, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, the UK's anti-corruption pledge tracker, which is a civic tech tool that we've developed in the UK, uh, which we found to be really, really effective, and I'm hoping that uh, you guys will see the same as us. Ooh. So, um, before I go into it, I will explain TIUK and what we do, just so you can have a bit of context about where this idea came from. So, um, we are the UK uh, branch of Transparency International, just as we sound. Um, we are um, one of 100, over 100 offices around the world which look at corruption in our own country context. So, in the UK, uh, we look at um, the corruption in our country, corruption that goes through our country and the UK's role in corruption overseas. So as you can imagine, that's a lot of work. Um, together with our, our uh, friends and colleagues around the world, we make up the world's leading anti-corruption movement. Um, uh, and we do uh, a lot of work in all of these different countries in lots of different ways. Again, back in the UK, um, traditionally our work is um, direct advocacy based on robust research. And that kind of combination is something that I think um, a lot of our colleagues around the world can say they replicate as a basic, but we do it in different ways. Um, just to flag also, a number of my colleagues from different offices around the world are here this week. Um, so if you uh, speak to any of us, just uh, say hello and talk about corruption, because we like that. Um, here, here are a couple of examples of um, what our research looks like. So uh, typically, our research team will spend months doing research on a certain topic, um, and then our advocacy team will spend months doing advocacy on that topic. They'll take our reports to our leaders, to our governments, to businesses, and say, this is what we think you should do better. Um, and that is, has historically been really, really effective. However, more recently, um, as things change quicker, and uh, time, you know, the, everything comes up, and it's a crazy time for everyone in the last couple of years especially, um, these big, beautiful documents that we pour our heart and soul into are very time sensitive, and their relevance is very, very short-lived. So we've been trying to think of ways to um, adapt quicker to topics that come up and make the changes that we think uh, are necessary. So uh, in looking for opportunities, um, we uh, were proud when the UK government in 2016 announced an anti-corruption summit. Um, we spent classic TI, we spent months doing advocacy and research in the months beforehand, uh, campaigning to our governments and helping our colleagues around the world to um, lobby theirs to uh, make sure that it was an effective forum that made uh, promises and changes that had impact really on anti-corruption. We didn't want another talk shop. Um, once the summit happened, we were really, really impressed. So we had 44 governments attend, um, five international organizations, and together they made over 700 individual commitments. Now these commitments weren't wishy-washy things, like we will stand together to tackle corruption. They were much more specific. They were, we will develop a strategy, we will introduce this legislation, we will work with each other on integrity. And these kind of things, we were, again, really impressed to see our governments uh, promise these pledges. Um, but again, uh, what we didn't want was a talk shop, and what they didn't have was a mechanism for follow-up or implementation. So this kind of conference was incredible, it was impressive, it was necessary, but the final piece of the puzzle was missing. Um, and to avoid it being this talk shop, as so many of these conferences are, where our leaders meet up and they make these statements and shake hands and stand on these beautiful, shiny blue stages, uh, we decided that we would step in and uh, try and plug that gap. So we developed the anti-corruption pledge tracker, um, which again is more or less what it sounds like on the tin. So why did we want to do it? Um, we wanted to incentivize and pressure our governments into uh, making the changes that they promised that they'd make. So um, kind of a carrot and a stick approach, celebrations if you did well, and uh, you know a bit of a loud criticism if you didn't do well. Um, we wanted to maintain and increase the standards of publicity and transparency that our governments had said that they would commit to. Um, we had a long discussion about accountability earlier, but I think we can generally understand what this means. Um, we want to, wanted to hold our governments accountable for the promises that they'd made, all 700 of them, ideally. Um, and obviously, we, want to, we wanted to encourage civic participation in the work that our governments are doing, especially on tackling corruption, because nobody can do it on their own. Um, and so once it was made, what is it? It is an accountability tool more than it is a research project, um, although it does have scope to you know, uh, snowball into that kind of thing. Um, it tracks 15 of the UK's anti-corruption commitments from the summit. 
Uh, it's based on publicly available evidence. In a minute, I'll show you exactly what the tool looks like. Um, but just so you understand, it's based on evidence that is publicly available, not just from anecdotes or emails or behind closed doors conversations. Um, and again, we wanted to make sure that the government was really, really on board with the project from the beginning, because for us to hold them to account properly, they need to think that we're friendly and you know, it needs to be this, this incredible cycle. So um, this is more or less what the UK anti-corruption pledge tracker looks like. Um, so I'll just talk you through it. So here is a sample of eight of the commitments, and this is as of last week, I think I took the screenshot. Um, so we have the category of each of the commitments, and we also have details of each relevant government department that is accountable for delivering on the commitment. Um, we have the exact wording of the commitment from the summit so that we can literally hold them to account for what they said they'd do with uh, not much wiggle room. Um, and um, if you click through, you can also see detail on the uh, deadline that the government gave themselves to deliver on these commitments. Um, in terms of what the categories mean, uh, I think it's fairly intuitive, but I, I do this every day, so I'll just explain them. Um, overdue, uh, for example, this one in the bottom corner, the Innovation Hub is overdue, which means that it has not been completed by the deadline that the government set themselves. Um, pending means that there is either no evidence available or there's evidence of things not being done. Uh, underway means that activity has started, which is the blue one. Activity has started, but it hasn't yet, not yet been completed. And all the lovely green ones have been completed um, since the summit happened in 2016. Um, now, like I said, when we first um, made this project, we wanted to uh, just have it as an accountability tool, so very much holding a mirror up to the government and what they said they'd do, and just uh, kind of republishing their data in this format. Um, but since then, we found it necessary to actually add a bit more narrative, a bit more nuance to, the, to what was happening, a bit more TI to it. Um, so as you can see in this bottom one, we've added a nice little thumbs down. <laughs> um, and that more or less means that while we recognize that progress is being made, we're not satisfied with it, which either means that it's being done to a poor standard, um, or it's being done late, or it's done, uh, nobody knows what's in, who's in charge of what. Um, and through things like this, we're already seeing impact. So when we were, just a, a small story for you, when we were um, testing that thumbs down, um, we had it up for maybe 20 minutes, just on a dummy, a dummy pledge. And I had both an email and a missed call from the UK government asking what it meant. Uh, which showed to me that they were really checking it much more than many other people were. And that, I, I think, is an impact. It shows that um, there is this sense of healthy competition between government departments to make sure that their pledge isn't worse than somebody else's. And that's kind of a collateral that we hadn't planned for, but we think is uh, really impressive. So looking at um, progress. So when we first launched this project in September 2016, this was the status on the day that we launched. Um, so uh, one of the 15 pledges was complete. Um, five were underway, which meant, again, the activity had started but not yet been completed. And nine were pending, which meant that there was no evidence available or there was evidence that nothing had happened. Um, and that was understandable. It had only been four months since the summit, so we couldn't really have expected a lot. Um, but that's what it looked like at the beginning. You can see at the time that we actually didn't have an option for overdue because maybe optimistically we thought that that wouldn't <laughs> be necessary since we know different. Um, now, as of last week, again, we have eight of the 15 commitments are completed. Um, three are uh, inactive or pending, uh, two are underway, and two are overdue. Now, obviously, we can't put all of this change down to us and our pledge tracker, although we'd like to. Um, I think what we can say, though, is that the fact that we're looking means that government are responding a bit more uh, with a little bit more of a catalyst than if we weren't looking. Um, and so for us, this is already having a lot of impact. But just to go into a couple of specifics, on the impact. Um, so of the four commitments that have been, of four of the eight commitments that have been completed, I'm just going to talk through the, the kind of a bit more practical way that will impact on corruption, uh, especially in the UK and overseas. So the strategy that was uh, launched in December last year, it was a year late, so we weren't too delighted about that. But nonetheless, we have a strategy now, which sets out the UK's intentions for tackling corruption for the next two years. And this is something that in a very detailed way outlines um, milestones, goals, targets, objectives, all of those words, uh, responsible departments, um, specific things they want to achieve by 2020 on tackling corruption. And kind of as an evolution of the initial statement that we, we're currently using for this project, this is something that we can, uh, again, base a lot of our advocacy and accountability work on going forward. So that's really helpful. 
Um, in June 2016, the UK launched um, uh, a public register of beneficial ownership information, which is the first of any G20 country to do so, which again is really impressive. Um, and more or less, this uh, allows the public to access the information of uh, any owners of UK companies, which makes it really, really difficult for money laundering to go through the UK. Again, one of TIUK's big asks. Um, in November of 2016, the UK implemented the Open Contracting Data Standard, um, which means that since then, the UK has been publishing information on its bids and the final contracts that it's awarded. Um, and um, some of you may know that public procurement is one of the biggest corruption risks for any government. And so that this information is now transparent and public is, again, a huge win. Um, unexplained wealth orders um, are essentially a tool which allow law enforcement uh, to investigate whether or not an asset of a certain value has been obtained lawfully. If it hasn't, it gets frozen. Um, and that was only committed to be consulted on in May two years ago, um, but already it's come into law and into force. So already we can see that um, uh, law enforcement have uh, started to investigate 22 million pounds worth of assets in the UK, thanks to this tool being introduced. Um, and I think that all of these things, even on their own, are really impressive, but there are much more things on the way. And I think that if we're working towards this uh, implementation and this completion of these uh, commitments, then that's a huge win for us and anti-corruption everywhere. So, um, like I say, we have this in the UK, and we're really proud of it. Um, last year, we got some funding to work with our colleagues around the world in lots of different countries to develop similar tools with them for their national context also. So we developed um, the same tools with our colleagues in Ghana, Kenya, and Afghanistan, um, all of which are up and running, and I'm happy to give you details of them after this conversation. Um, and this year, we have further funding to do the same uh, with our colleagues in Nigeria, Sri Lanka, Jordan, and Mexico. So again, happy to discuss that and that process with any of you. Um, as well as this, we love pledge tracking, um, as well as this, uh, we have built a global anti-corruption pledge tracker, uh, which looks at 27 of those initial 44 countries that were at the summit. And across all of these 27 countries, we are monitoring with our partners in those countries what each single government has done since the summit on anti-corruption. We're updating this roughly every six months. Um, so hopefully this will, be, this will have new information in a few weeks or so. Um, but through it, you can see specifically um, what each country's status is and uh, the work they're doing on their anti-corruption commitments. So that is uh, the end of my presentation about the pledge trackers. I hope you found it as interesting and helpful as we do. Thank you very much.